Hey guys, welcome back to another video tutorial. In this video, I'm going to be showing you how to use React, ReCharts, and WebSockets to display live data in a line chart that we have right here. So in this tutorial, I'm using my CPU usage on my laptop. So you can see when we first started the video, my CPU is around 2.2 or 20%. And now as I'm recording and moving around and talking more, my CPU usage is going up to 75%. So that is the data we're going to be displaying. Let's go ahead and dive into the code and see how we did this. So I didn't want to spend too much time with the project setup and talking about my dependencies. So here are the dependencies we're using, but the important ones are recharts.js and um, OS utils. Recharts is used for displaying bar graphs and line charts inside your React app. And OS utils gives you the ability to see what your CPU usage is. Um, and you can see those here. We have recharts.org. They have a lot of good documentations and how to use our API. And they have an example of how they use their component, which we're going to be using in this tutorial. The second package is OS Utils, just something I found in the NPM registry. But basically, after you install it, you could require it and then ask what your CPU usage is. And they have an example piece of code here where you can print out your CPU usage. So that would be cool for generating some live data every second and sending it back to the web client. And then, of course, we're using Parcel and NodeMon and other things to get this uh, project. And the last thing I'll talk about in this package, a JSON file, is we have a start script, which will start our client and our server, which I am running in my terminal down here. So if I go to my terminal, you can see I have two panels open. The left is my client. The right is my server, which is being refreshed by NodeMon. And my left is parcel, which is refreshing whenever I save my code. So I'm going to keep that minimized for now, but just know that those are running in the background. So if you don't know how parcel works, uh, you point it to an HTML file. It's going to load in that HTML file, and that is going to compile all this to a disk folder here. So our main entry point for our code is this client.js file. So let's just go ahead and look at that. And then what we also want to have open is our server.js file. And those are the two main JavaScript files we're going to be talking about in this video tutorial. And I think it makes more sense to maybe start with the server code in this one. It doesn't really matter, but I'll, let's just start with the server code because it's a little bit easier. I have a lot of the stuff already required um, just to save some time. But again, we have OS utils, which is useful for getting the CPU usage. We are creating a HTTP server here, which we'll need to pass to Socket.io. Line 4, we initialize a new Socket.io and pass it the server, and then also provide it some transports so that stuff gets sent immediately when we tell it to emit and not to wait around for a buffer to fill up. So the two steps I have listed out here that we need to kind of implement is, number one, listen for the Socket connections. And number two, every second, emit a CPU event to the user. So let's just try to work out these steps. So step one, how do we listen to a socket connection? Well, there is a method called dot on. So I can say io dot on. And then I can type connection to listen to when a client connects. And that takes a callback function as a second argument. And that will be invoked whenever my HTML page loads and tries to connect to my web server. Step two, every second, emit a CPU event to the user. So how do we do something every second? Well, in JavaScript, you have these set interval functions. So I'm going to say set interval, and I could pass it one second. So I'll just do 100, or sorry, 1,000 milliseconds is equal to one second. So that takes care of the first part of this step two. The next part is emit a CPU event to the user. So how do we do that? Well, we brought in this library called OSUtils, so we might want to look at their documentation to figure out what is going on. And after looking at their documentation, it looks like they have a method called CPU usage that we can invoke. So let's just go ahead and invoke that here. And I will pass it a callback. It will take CPU percent as an argument. At least that is what it looks like here. V is the CPU percentage. And what we want to do here is we want to emit that percent to the client who's connected. So another method that you have access to on this client object. So as a reminder, this is a socket IO client object, which has an emit function. So I can say client.emit. 
and I can pass it a custom string. So in this case, I'm just going to make my stream, st uh, string called CPU. And then as a second argument, I could pass any type of data, like an object, I could pass a string, a, a number, a Boolean. So in this case, let's just pass it CPU percent. So let's save that. And at this point, we can't really test this out because we don't have a client that's actually connecting to this. So let's move on to our client code. But assuming we wrote this all correctly, this should be good to go. So similar to how I did the server, the client already has a lot of code already set up to kind of save some time. But I will highlight the important parts. We have Socket.io being included or imported at the top. And that is needed to connect to our socket server. We have React and React DOM. Technically, we don't need these bootstrap things for right now. So we'll just remove them to keep this a little bit straightforward. We have use effect and use state, which we're going to be using in our functional React component to, you know, create a on component mount callback and also to store that data that's coming back from the server. Okay, so we're importing recharts, and this is needed obviously for displaying that line graph here. And gives us a couple of components like line chart, x axis, y axis, and we're, we're going to pretty much copy and paste this into our code when we get to that point. But for right now, let's just move on. So, getting to the actual implementation side of the client, we first connect to our socket server here. So, we say IO, we pass it a URL. We pass it some parameters, um, some, some options so that it automatically emits the event when we do dot emit. And then we want to create our functional component here. So in React, you typically make a component. You can make them using functional components or you can do the traditional like classes that extend the react.component object. I'm using functional. So all we need to do here is at the bottom on line 29, we say render our functional app component and put it inside an element with the ID of root. So if I look at an index.html, we have a div here with ID of root. So when the client code runs and React is ready to go, it's going to render that component or that chart right in here. So again, I have two steps listed out here. We have step one is listen for a CPU event and update the state. Step two is render the line chart using the state. So step one, we probably want to initialize something when this app component first mounts to the page, right? So there's a couple of lifecycle events that React provides you. Um, we're going to be using hooks to kind of instrument those. So in this case, we can say the use effect hook. So up here, if you say use effect, and you pass it a callback function and then as a second argument you pass it an empty array that will basically only run once and also only run when the app mounts so let me let me say that again use effect will only run once and it will only run when the component mounts hopefully i explained that good uh, but if you were to put other things inside of this like for instance let's say there's a prop passed in here um, you could listen to that prop and this would rerun any time the prop changes. Also, if you, uh, if you don't put this empty array, this use effect will basically rerun every single time the app tries to re-render, which would mean we're probably going to keep on binding to the socket for events over and over again. And we don't want to do that. So that was a long winded explanation for what an affected slash hook is. So let's just move forward. So we have the hook set up to only run once. And what we need to do is listen to a particular event on the socket. So if you remember on the server side, we're emitting event called CPU. So if I go back to my client, I could say socket on CPU, and I will get a CPU percent as my second argument, because this is listening for that event. And then I'm getting that payload back from the web socket event. So at this point, I probably need to store that on state, right? So the second part of step one was update the state. Well, 
right now we don't have any state on this component, right? In order to have dynamic data change in this React component, you need a state variable that you can kind of use these curly braces to render with. We don't have that yet, so let's use another hook called useState, and let's initialize some state called data. And that is going to be initialized as an empty array. So if you don't know what the use state hook does, basically it's going to allow this app component to have state called data. And then it also gives you a setter function called, you can name this whatever you want, but in this case I'm calling it set data. And it's going to initialize that data variable to an empty array when this component first renders. And we're going to be using this to store all of those CPU events that come back from the server. So with that being said, we have a way to set the state or update the state here, right? And what we want to do is just keep on appending those CPU percentages to our array. So basically on line 26, we just need to do set data. And one interesting thing about this set method is that it can either take a value, so I could pass it something like this, or it can take a callback. So I could say um, current data, take a callback, and then return something. So the reason we want to use a callback in this instance is because if we just try to do something like this, so I'll make an array dot 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 slash data and then CPU percent. Bear with me, I'm kind of jumping around and explaining stuff. but. This is something I kind of got caught up on. I tried to set data like this, which is basically just append the percentage to that data array. This will keep on overriding your empty array with an array of one value. So this will never grow of length greater than one. So what I had to do instead is you need to do a callback function and say current data or whatever you want to name it. And that will grab you the current value of the state at that particular callback function call. Kind of confusing, probably read through the React docs if you don't understand that. But now whenever we get a CPU percent back from the server, we're just appending that percentage to that array. So that should be pretty straightforward. Um, I think this pretty much takes, takes care of step one. Now step two is we need to render the line chart using that state. Well, how do we render a line chart? If you go back to the example, Luckily, they give you an example you can just copy, so that's pretty convenient. So thank you for having an awesome landing page. And let's hack at this a little bit to make it work. But basically, line 33 takes a property called data, and that happens to be named the same as our state up here. So we're passing our state into that line chart component. And behind the scenes, that's probably using vectors or SVGs or Canvas to render out the line chart. I don't really know. Feel free to read more of the docs to figure that out. <clears throat> but some other important components that we need to modify is we only want one line. If you notice in their example, they have two different lines going. One's green and one's blue. So let's just stick with one line. Let's just get rid of the stroke color for now and get rid of that. Artesian grid is that grid that you're seeing here. We could, I guess, keep that around. Um, but the important takeaways is the data key property, right? These expect your data to have properties on them. So that might be something we need to go back to the server and refactor because I forgot about that. But basically it's assuming that your data array is a, an array of objects that have a property called name and a property called UV in this example. In this case, I'm going to change this to value and I'll, this, I'll keep this as name. So if that then it makes sense, let's look at the server and let me change something and then maybe it'll all click. Again, the rechart library requires the array to have objects. So let's just change this to an object instead that has a value and it has a name of um, CPU or something. So let's change data key. Yeah, yeah. So the x axis is what you want to display on your x axis. 
So in this case, I don't even think we need to display anything here. We could probably just leave that blank, but we'll we'll see in a second. I think at this point we should be able to run this code and see if we get some errors or if this even works. All right, Cartesian grid is not defined. Let's just comment that out for now because I didn't import it at the top and see if that kind of helps us progress in this tutorial. All right, so we have a line chart. It is rendering and every second we're getting a new CPU usage from our server that's sending those events over the WebSocket. So that is pretty awesome. So notice here, it just keeps on printing out CPU down in the bottom. Now, what we probably want to do instead is have that be some type of time. So instead of name of CPU, you could probably have like a tick just to keep it simple. Um, I'll just do this just, just for this, the sake of this tutorial. I mean, you could change this to be actual time, time stamps if you wanted to. Um, but in my case, I am just going to keep it simple and put tick. Uh, let me increment that by one. Refresh my page because my server just restarted because I saved some code. All right, so every tick on the server, we are getting back an event. I'm not sure why it's skipping by two. That might just be a rechart option where it's not rendering everything because there's already so much already on the page. So let me just refresh one more time and see what happens. Um, yeah, we'll have to, I think, I think it's just the, the range of the X is just set to this. Feel free to investigate that. I'm pretty sure it's just because it's like over here on the Y axis, it's just a range. So it's not actually every single value listed out. It's just kind of giving you the best step value that it can generate. But anyway, there you have it. You have a line chart being rendered and updated live every second. And we are grabbing the CPU usage from our backend. We're sending that over from our Node.js script that's running, which is hosting an HTTP server and hosting a WebSocket server to kind of send over those messages. So I really hope this was a good tutorial. I kind of skipped some of the beginner steps of importing all the stuff. Um, but hopefully these listing out some like simple things we can work on and kind of working them out was a fun approach. Again, if you have any feedback of how I can improve these videos, be sure to leave a comment below. Be sure to subscribe and like. That would really help me out a lot. And then lastly, all the code for this channel is hosted at github.com slash codycybert slash YouTube. And you will see in real time chart web sockets, we have all the code that I just wrote with you all. So be sure to check that out if you want to actually work off of this and learn for yourself. Otherwise, have a great day and thank you so much for watching.